Perry here at uh, 67 Broadway, our project home. We're continuing with plastering the colonial trades here in Salem City in the early 19th century, late 18th century. But again, our uh, restoration project house here is dated 1801. Uh, so we're going to talk about plastering today. Uh, possibly if we could get a shot, it's wonderful. We have uh, the ceilings come down in the roof just above us here. And uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about actually what plaster is, how you restore it, how you repair it. And it, unfortunately here we had some, some vandals coming in, they were stealing the piping and, and uh, they probably broke the water line and uh, wetted the plaster and the whole thing dropped down. So, But uh, I just took a piece off the mantle here of plaster and uh, just take a look. These are, these are the keyways. These go between the lath. The lath are the boards that actually hold the plaster uh, to the wall. And as you can see in here, interestingly enough, this is actual hair. And hair is the binder to give good tensile strength to uh, the plaster when it wants to crack through the seasonal changes. The hair keeps it together. A um, little bit about the hair and plaster. Uh, they used horse hair and ox hair, goat hair originally. And what I found, uh, I was actually, I'm restoring the Samuel Shivers house in Woodstown. And what I found there is 13 different kinds of hairs. And later research, there was actually an undertaker that lived in the house at one time. So the possibility when he was putting the uh, aiding and abetting in the 1813 edition there, possibly he was cutting hairs off of some dead people and putting it mixing in. And we found red hair, African American hair, blue hair, black hair, you name it. Anyway, we found a lot of different hairs, straight hair, curly hair. So how interesting. But if we look close, this is very consistent. Um, and and this, this is almost burgeoning on human hair, not horse hair. Look how fine it is right here. But it does a very, very good job of maintaining itself. So uh, as we look back up on the, the uh, ceiling here, well, we're going to talk, talk about the lath. And you're seeing the lath up there. Lath, again, this is the wooden strips that holds the plaster up. And back in the early 19th century through 18th century, and I'm going to point up there, you can notice how wide and how abnormal these are. These were riven. Riven is splitting with a fro or an axe or an adze. So the great thing about that, you go down the natural grain of the wood, the curvature of the wood, so when you, when you nail this back up, it's not going to twist or cut. The issue is, when they cut these, these were green boards. They, would put them, they were put up green, nailed up, and what would happen is, when they would dry, if it's riven, it doesn't twist, cup, or crack. These are hardware store, uh, purchased down at uh, Smick Lumber, and you can see they're a bit smaller, but these are cut on a table saw. The issue is here is, these are not following the grain of the wood, but when, when we get these, they're dry. So I, I don't want to make it too technical out there today, but just suppose we're restoring the lath. We have a missing lath. We put these dry ones up. The wet plaster, all the moisture gets absorbed into the wood. And when the wood gets that, it wants to go the way of the natural grain. So the, the wood it starts, the lath starts to cup, and as the plaster and lath are drying, you don't get a totally flat surface. So what we have to do when we're using new lath like this, we have to rehydrate it first considerably before we start our plastering. The other situation they ran into in the 18th and 19th century, which they probably didn't think about, they're nailing the lath to the floor joists. And what happens is all that wood are on a steel nail rust. Not only does it rust, but they're nailing into floor joists that are also green. And as the, the, uh, the nail goes in and everything dries, the nail tends to pull back out. So in a lot of these homes, within the first, I would say, two or three years, you're going to find periodic sags, maybe not noticeable to the layman, but they are sags because they should have taken into account to dry their floor joists before they were plastering, and that tremendous weight and gravity pulling down on it. So what we have up here are Riven lath. And uh, today we're using actually stainless steel galvanized nails to hold it up, or I'm using in the conservation, and we'll be using here at 67 uh, Salem. And we're actually going to uh, have a little, uh, we'll have a class in here actually riving some wood lath to use in, in the restoration of all the holes we found around the house. Okay, we're going we're to generally speak a few, uh, few notes about the history of plaster. And plaster is really lime. Lime is the binder. Uh, lime is the precursor to Portland cement as we know it today. Going back about 7500 BC, as far as we know, this all started in the area of Jordan. Uh, they were using lime, uh, lime dust and, and lime with impurities and clays 
to actually coat the external of their, their homes, their, their fireplaces, their floors, to, uh, to, to have moisture control, to have smoother and more, uh, more homey looking surfaces even back then, 7,500 years BC. Fast forward to about the 14th century, not a lot occurred using quote lime and quote plaster. Um, and in southern England, when the, the Tudor style house in that late 14th century started to occur, that's the stick style. You externally see the timber framing with the infill, the nogging of bricks and with stones. And they started using a, a mixture of lime, um, again, lime dust, crushed lime, and things like that on the outside. And again, we went into kind of to the Dark Ages until the 18th century. And there was uh, two scientists working in England, and they were having issues in the English Channel with ships running aground. They needed and wanted to put a lighthouse out into the channel. But how do you do that with, with the, the constant current destroying the, uh, you know, the fabric of the stones and things of that nature? So with much experimentation, and, and there was a challenge met by Parliament to find a solution. And what they found was if they took lime, which is either chalk, shells, oyster shells, clam shells, and these are compressed, compressed, forming limestone for millions and millions of years. If they took that lime and they heated it in a process and they ground it up into a fine powder, they would relieve the CO2. So the carbon dioxide would go out and you would make a hydro, a lime that's ready for hydration. So when you burn lime, it's called slaking. Slaking of lime leaves it ready to be basically turned into plaster. So in the 18th century here in Salem, you would have had itinerant individuals coming around, and they would have, from all the information we found coming from probably the bivalve area, where it was a great oystering area, they would come up here probably once or twice a week with their wagons full of shells, full of oyster shells. They would set out back, and the probability this is what occurred. They would be out back of all these houses that were being built ready to be plastered. They'd set up a kiln, and they'd actually cook the shells to the extent where they were only falling into, into, a, into a dust, fibrous type uh, uh, consistency, and they would continue to grind them after that. So all you have to do at that point is add water, and the lime hardens just like cement. So what they would do is, you would have your itinerant person dealing with the carpenter building your house. He would, he would get the lime a couple days ahead of time, or actually make lime as needed. It would take approximately 48 hours to get you know, enough lime for two more rooms. So he would be always ahead of the curve. And in doing so, they'd be compensated for very little, some money, and, and they probably would want to live in the structure that was uh, you know, half built or half framed at that time. And, and that's how that was taken care of. So plaster in the 18th century, involved just a few components. It involved this slaked lime, which was this heat, heated lime. Now, today, and even back then, it was called natural hydraulic lime. And that's what they used in this house in the 18th century, early 19th century, and that's what we'll be using. Some of the finest deposits in the world are located on the English coast and in central France. And we'll be using Saint Leclerc coming out of central France. That'll be the plaster we're using, and it's a lime base. So plastering comes in three phases, essentially. The first phase is the rough-in phase. Once your lath is reaffixed to the ceiling, and again, we're going to be using either stainless steel screws or galvanized screws to prevent any rusting. Once it's affixed, we want to come up and just fill in the void. We want to push the plaster between the lath and, and key it. And as we uh, had seen over here, These are the keys, so you're going to be forcing the plaster in with your trowels to get the key in. At the end of that time, it's just finished, you're going to pull out this apparatus. And this apparatus is going to do, it's going to screed, it's going to put lines in, it's going to prepare it for the second phase. We're going to allow four to five days for the plaster to start the cure, but we don't want a total cure. We want a chemical bond and a, 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 a moisture bond with the next layer. So if it's totally dry, you're not going to get a good bond between the three phases of plaster. So we have the brown phase, or the beginning phase of plaster now, the second phase, or scratch phase, we're putting in. At that point, we're putting in another three-eighths of an inch. So the first phase will be three-eighths of an inch, the second phase, and then the third phase, which is going to be about an eighth inch, will be your finish phase. 
Plaster is, is today will be consisting of literally lime and abrasive, which will be sand and water, and the hair that we just mentioned. And here's some of the hair. This is horse hair I have in for the project already, okay? And uh, this is a never ending. We, we can get hundreds and hundreds of pounds of this as needed. And you're literally going to chop it. You're going to chop it up into two or three inch pieces and drop it and have some apprentice vigorously mix it into the lot. In this bucket, actually, we are mixing bucket. So at the, at the second phase, we need to do our scratching for the final phase. But each subsequent phase from the, the third, the second to the first, you'll use a finer grid of sand and a, an upped amount of lime. For hardening. And at the end, the lime will almost like cement, the cream will start coming down or coming to the surface. And you know, by, make, by taking your trowel around, and you're just going to continually make upward motions, smoothing and smoothing. And that's that's how that's how the uh, that's how the plaster does it. He starts low, he goes from left to right, up like this, up the wall. The ceiling is much more challenging. Obviously, you're either going to be on stilts or you're going to be on some type of scaffold. So, as I said, our, our plaster for the house here is going to be coming from France. Uh, it'll be a very high grade uh, finish type plaster with adhesive in it. And uh, we plan to get this started probably sometime in the middle of summer doing the, the plaster repairs on the house. So, thanks for joining us here at 67 Market Street. And please join us next week. We're going to be talking about brickwork. Uh, brickwork on the herringbone sidewalk outs outside, the steps. We're going to look at the steps are not original. We're going to explain why they're not and how to repoint a house like this. And we're actually going to be using lime mortar. And I, I want to say this one thing that we didn't, I'm not sure if we finished, but the, 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 the individual in uh, the scientists in the 18th century developed this hydrated type lime. What they did was they actually created uh, wooden boxes and they sunk them into the English canal. They put the powdered lime in and the water from the channel hardened it, and it actually would harden in about an hour underwater. So this plaster is not something that's that delicate. Unfortunately, our house here has tremendous humidity levels here from the back of the house, which has been leaking. And as you can see by all the wallpaper that's fallen off, but really the, uh, the plaster is not effective. I mean, it is literally as hard as cement. We could have used this plaster on the outside, literally. And another term used for plastering uh, not so much in the States, but in England, which developed plaster is render. So uh, here in the States, they don't usually call it render. They leave the word render for uh, external mortar. Um, but anyway, so uh, thanks everyone for watching.